Generally, um, I've been really, really impressed with the leadership on the African continent. I think there's been a very strong, deliberate effort to contain and control uh, the advent of COVID on the continent. Um, at the end of February and early March, I was in Mozambique and Sierra Leone and Liberia before there were any incidences there and already there was temperature ta taking, the Veronica buckets were out with the chlorinated water, people were wearing masks, there was social distancing. So that was very impressive to see the ramp up in all those countries um, of a real effort to ensure that the disease didn't take hold. Uh, there's also been some very strong communications out of several countries, um, very clear messages about how decisions are being made, what uh, leaders would like people to do, very aware that it can't be top down, that, that we are asking communities and people to participate in what needs to be done to keep everybody safe thinking about who are the right messengers and how to reach different populations, whether it's radio, SMS, that, that different groups need to be reached in different ways and the messengers for what we're asking health workers to do or teachers to do is very different than what we're asking rural farmers to do or young people in the cities. And, and some leaders have been um, exceptionally thoughtful about how to reach those different audiences in a way that will resonate and bring everybody together to work through this. And the third thing I'd say is most governments that we've been talking to, most government leaders are thinking very hard um, and planning now for what comes next, that there hasn't been the onslaught in most of these countries of cases. So you know, how do they want to handle this? How do they want to use limited resources? There's been some really good planning and thinking about, um, especially if we're going to have a major health response, how do we do that in a way that strengthens our health system for the long term and isn't just about using tons of resources on COVID alone, but how is this a you know, we can get the best win out of this situation that we can. Um, and finally, you know, I'd like to recognize President Ramaphosa in his role as chairman of the AU, uh, Vera Songwe. You know, they have really been leading the effort on a continent-wide coordinated response. And that's been really impressive. Um, the envoys and what they've been able to negotiate um, in terms of debt relief and helping other countries be supportive about the financial burden that this takes on Africa without leaving every country to fight for its own. Um, and, and Vera has really been instrumental in bringing together the private sector to work through the logistics of moving PPE on the continent, of making sure everybody's needs can be fulfilled in um, helping different sectors think about the responses and coordinating that with CDC Africa and the information that we have so that there, there is good streamlining lining across the continent. I, I would argue that scenario planning is something that governments have long been practicing you know, on a personal level, I think the first time I ever heard about scenario planning was in association with the Bay of Pigs and Kennedy and the team that he brought together to play through the different responses um, that they might have to the Russians and how they would respond and clearly feel that approach got them to uh, a successful outcome. But I think you know, war is the ultimate of 
constant scenario planning between a president and military experts and others. Uh, but I think we've been seeing for a while uh, pandemic and emergency scenario planning well before we have you know, anything specific or tangible in hand. Uh, the other place that uh, was exciting to see the scenario planning for me was when Mohammed Pate rolled out saving one million lives as he did that or, or before he publicly did that. He looked at the uh, streams of diseases and interventions and the geographies and had several scenarios but had done the work to think about for the resources available, uh, what was the most cost efficient way to save a million lives. So I don't think it's all been in the private sector by any means. In fact, I think some of the most ambitious, thoughtful, important scenario planning has happened in the public sector. I think what's important about the scenario planning is the process of it. It is the coming together to really have clarity about the North Star, about what you're trying to achieve. So in this instance, you know, Africa has, has a different demographic situation um, than other parts of the world. 70% of the population is under 30, less than 5% is over 65. Uh, and there's lots we don't know. Um, we don't know how having HIV or being stunted, how much more or less vulnerable that makes one to the disease. Um, but it would be rational um, for the North Star to be more broadly about how do we have the least um, mortality during this difficult time? How do we protect our elderly and our health workers who might be more susceptible um, as priority to the whole population, possibly? Um, where food security, um, maintaining education might be really important to countries in this scenario. So I think it's the process of having the discussion that brings clarity about what you're trying to do and then being able to take the evidence um, and depoliticize that conversation and remove the biases to the greatest extent you can um, as you, you work toward that North Star. And then also it's about who's in the room. And I think, you know, there, there is sometimes an inclination to say, oh, COVID is a disease. Therefore, I'm going to punt this to the health minister. And I think the thing about this kind of scenario planning and thinking through the unintended consequences, but what you're, of what you're trying to do and, and to match a policy decision and bring that all the way through the implications requires the best thinking and a, a mix of expertise. And it's that process of, of winnowing down and getting the right people in the room who can constantly take the new information and, and the new thinking about how do we problem solve to get us to the best solution that we can with the knowledge we have at, at any particular time. This crisis really, really is challenging. Um, and I think we can't beat ourselves up over the fact that we're going to stop and change and course correct. We're learning a lot about the disease on a daily, weekly basis. Technologies are changing. Uh, accessibility to those technologies as they emerge will change for leaders. It's a huge challenge. And I think what leaders have to pride themselves on is being nimble 
continuing to use the best data and evidence as they can access it and bringing the public and communities along with them. That it's not that they're going backwards or constantly shifting and changing, but to be transparent about we've learned this and this is why we're all going to change our behavior. So for example, the evidence is starting, I believe, to show that masks are going to be hugely important, maybe temperature taking less important. You know, being able to bring communities to come along on those changes to make everybody safer isn't going backwards, it's, um, it's continuing productively the process um, that we're in. And for some of this, we have really good data, and for some, we don't. And I think sometimes uh, the challenge has been almost so much data coming at people. And, and again, it's that importance of really having the North Star of then finding the data that's most important um, to, to test against those certain interventions that we might choose to use and to see how that would change things. Um, there are, you know, if, if countries don't have, um, if they don't know some of those best data sources, that's certainly something that we're tracking at Big Win um, and happy to try to make those matches for people. But um, there, there, are entities that are really taking many streams of data and trying to find out where the public is, what's working, what do we know about the epidemiology. Uh, so, so some of that exists, some is going to be hypotheses and, and playing those through. Um, but the important thing is that if you have a North Star um, and there isn't data that maybe that's where you have to fill the gap yourself and and try to collect some of the data if that's what's most important to you. You know, for example, if if we cannot afford in some of these countries to not to have a generation of children who miss a year or two of education, you know, we may have to call out um, and find out, you know, our kids listening to radio. Um, you know, are they, you may even have to run through, you know, are they learning from that? What would make it more interesting to them? Is it the right time of day even? Um, so, you know, there may need to be some proactive work, but I think the most important thing is that governments are able to convey to their people and build trust that there's clarity in where they're going and what they're prioritizing, who is helping them think through this and the evidence they're using to get there, and that it's everybody's commitment um, to get to those points and us coming together to take the steps that's, that's going to leave us in the best position.